Highlander. You were so cool. What went wrong? This movie should have been remembered as the cool fantasy movie that it is, but I feel like its reputation has been soiled slightly by a few horrible sequels, the first of which we shall be discussing today. I really wasn't prepared for just how bad of a job this movie does at being a sequel. It does pretty much everything you shouldn't do when continuing a story this way. Wish me luck everyone. Without further ado, on with the review. I reviewed the original Highlander at the end of last year, and I really really enjoyed revisiting the film, which I had seen quite a few times as a child. If you haven't seen the film, I recommend that you go watch it, or watch my original review before watching this video. Before I begin my commentary, I feel the need to emphasise just how bad this film really is. It is literally listed as one of the worst films of all time on Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Get out the Bibles and crosses everyone, we're gonna need them. In our opening scene, Connor, now an old man, is at an opera house. While watching the performance on stage, Connor has flashbacks to his... Home planet? <laughs> hmm, how do we make this movie interesting? I know, just add aliens! That's a great idea! Ramirez, still played by Sean Connery, is giving a speech to a gathering of rebels who are fighting against the leadership of a General Katana. Very original name. This is giving me Samurai Cop flashbacks. What does Katana mean? It means Japanese sword. So, Ramirez is a sorcerer, and Connor is supposed to be some kind of space Jesus to these aliens, and he is supposed to lead the rebellion. This isn't dissimilar to the beginning of the first Highlander movie, where Connor is at a wrestling match and he has flashbacks to being in the Highlands. The difference in that is that it was just snippets of action to build suspense and pique the audience's interest, whereas this is just a bunch of excuses that go on for way too long. General Katana crushes the rebellion, and Ramirez and Connor are put on trial in front of these spooky priest figures. Apparently, Immortality is considered to be unnatural among this species, but it's not explained very well, and we then get just about one of the stupidest attempts at retconning a backstory that I've ever seen. In that distant future, you will face other immortals in trial by combat, from which only one can survive, and, as is your way, you will die only when your head is cut from your body. So, what was all that about Connor being confused about his immortality in the first movie then? Why did Ramirez have to hunt him down and explain it all to him and train him? Are we just supposed to pretend that that didn't happen? Now go, and remember, there can be only one. No, 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 don't insult us by throwing that line in. This isn't a battle with the Kurgan, this isn't a cool movie. In this future, the ozone layer has been completely destroyed, causing many deaths due to the sun's deadly rays. Look. I know dystopias aren't uncommon in stories set in the future, but it feels so forced, and doesn't seem like a good fit for this franchise. There's even an OCP-style evil organisation called Shield Control, and it's being infiltrated by a militant organisation named Cobalt that opposes them. They are led by a woman called Louise Marcus, and they discover that the surrounding radiation levels are normal, despite the ozone layer being supposedly destroyed. I guess this is meant to parallel Connor's rebellion? The alien priests have been observing Connor, and hope that he will one day choose to return to the planet, but General Katana sends two goons to Earth to kill Connor behind the priests' backs. In a bar, Connor is confronted by a woman, and it's revealed that he used to work for a team that created an electromagnetic shield to essentially replace the ozone layer. Unfortunately, the catch was the absence of light and high temperatures. Shield control then took over completely. The woman attacks Connor with a bottle, and although he's been mortal for over three decades, his hand heals now. Okay, so we're also removing the entire point at the end of the first movie. Being immortal is shown to not be as cool as one would imagine, 
so I'd like to think being granted mortality would be more impactful on the story, rather than just taking it back later. Louise approaches Connor for help, as she and her group have figured out that the ozone layer has restored itself. The leader of S.H.I.E.L.D. control, David Blake, is covering it up in order to keep charging people for their protection from solar irradiance. And now we have this movie's Brenda. Katana's goons then show up, and to be honest, I forgot about them until now. And Connor calls out to Ramirez, as earlier in the film, the guy said some sorcery crap about always being linked to Connor, even in death. Totally not just an excuse to ignore his death in the first movie. They have it out from a bridge to a pram, and one of the goons is decapitated by the pram's wheels. Connor absorbs the quickening, causing destruction and havoc, and Connor walks out of an explosion as his younger self. He then battles the remaining goon, involving hover devices, and he kills him. This is so dumb. I don't know what else to say about it, it's just dumb. The film transports us to Glencoe, Scotland, where Ramirez was killed by the Kurgan in the last film, and he just... appears? As he tracks down Connor, we get some stupid, her der, I'm from the past, I'm Fry from Futurama moments, and he buys a new suit as to not draw attention to himself. At the same time, Katana beams himself to Earth to kill Connor himself, and when he lands on a train, he kills some Keanu Reeves looking guy for no reason and takes control of the train, driving it into a wall. Again, this sequence is mega stupid. Connor meets with his old friend and co-worker, Alan, and there's another flashback elaborating on previously established information. David Blake then interrupts the friend's meeting, and he has no reaction to Connor's now youthful appearance. I don't know if it's because he's just that much of a twat, or if it's just bad writing. I assume it's the latter. We get another flashback when Connor visits Brenda's grave, and it's just a rip-off of the scene where Heather dies in Highlander. You could call it a reference or a callback, but it's just lazy writing. The grieving is cut short when Katana arrives at the tomb, and they have to leave. No fighting on holy ground, remember? Ramirez and Connor are reunited in Spa, and they make a plan to take down the shield with Louise. David Blake sends Alan to Max, a so-called high-security prison, and our heroes break into Max to free Alan. They survive a shower of bullets that are fired at them, and get in by pretending to be corpses, which is a cool idea for all it's worth. When they find Alan, he is decrepit and dying, but is able to give Connor the coordinates to break through the shield before kicking the bucket. What a waste of time! He could have died in Max off screen, and Connor could have just found his notes hidden in his office or house or something. Louise, Connor, and Ramirez are trapped in a small room with a rotating fan closing in on them, but Ramirez stops the fan and opens the door with his magic, while the sound of bagpipes is heard in the background. I actually started laughing at this scene. It's so over the top and cheesy, I couldn't take it seriously. Ramirez disappears and the remaining two steal a truck from Max. Despite their trip being interrupted by Katana, they manage to escape and make it above the shield. Katana kills Blake and it adds nothing. They're both villainous, it's been established. Back at the shield, Connor fights Katana and is able to complete his mission. He chooses to stay on Earth with Louise and grow old. It's super anticlimactic and lifeless. It's literally just a rip-off of the ending of the previous movie. There can be only one. Shut up, stop trying to be something that you're not movie. Now, the most glaring issue with this film is probably the retconning. The whole alien backstory and sorcery nonsense completely ignores the lore of the original movie, as I've been saying throughout this video. Apparently, Clancy Brown was originally cast for this film, but when he read the script, he refused to do it. They sent me, like, the first ten pages of it, and I said, What the f- What is this? Give me the rest of the script? And they said, Well, we want your commitment before we give you the rest of the script. 
And they said, well, we're just going to pay you the same. And I said, nah, see you later. I'm not going to do this. First of all, this makes no sense. Second of all, you're not going to pay me anything. So there's no reason for me to do this at all. So then Christopher calls me up and says, oh, you've got to do this with us. You've got to do this with us. I said, Chris, it's horrible. The idea is terrible. What I read was awful. And he said, I helped write that. Okay, that's that's really sad. I'm really sorry that you have your name attached to this at all, Chris May. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I guess I'm never going to be doing any more Highlanders. He's a great guy and I love him to death, but it was doomed from the beginning. If I wasn't getting paid, I will do shit for money. But I'm not going to do shit for no money. I'll do quality for no money. So if it had been any good, maybe. But it was no good from the get-go. Can you even call this a Highlander movie? Why is he referred to as a Highlander if he isn't one? It was cooler when it was fantasy-based and more mysterious. Immortality being something natural within the world's universe. Like a real-world genetic trait, it can just happen to someone by chance. I don't see why this movie was even made. The first film had a perfect resolution, and it doesn't feel like it's in the same universe. Trying to force the science fiction angle was so unnecessary too. The setting and character design have a sort of Battlefield Earth feel to them, like it's riding the coattails of better made franchises. Louise is even played by the same actress who plays Princess Arulin in Dune. Supposedly, the script was messed with by investors during production, so maybe that explains it? According to the research that I've done, there were also several cuts made of this film in an attempt to salvage it post-release, due to the growing popularity of the franchise. The film I watched for this review is the Renegade cut from what I can tell, which is apparently considered to be the most coherent. The first half is more orderly, but the second half is definitely much harder to follow. The descriptions of the other cuts make them seem way messier though. Another thing that stood out to me was the music as the Queen songs featured in Highlander were so memorable to me. They do reuse It's a Kind of Magic and Who Wants to Live Forever. One golden glass. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, Mr. McLeod. But other than that, the music is pretty bland in this movie. Well, that's all for this video. I hope that you all appreciate my willingness to sit through these monstrosities of cinema so that you don't have to put yourselves through this. Be sure to follow me on social media, as they are all linked in my description box. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and as always, thanks for watching. Something like a polo to ease my mind, with polos by my side, I'll always shine. The blue and green ones are my favourite kind, but I'll eat the coloured ones from time to time. Cause polos is life, polos is life, polos is life, polos is life, polos is life. Polos is life.